Welcome back to C-Sharp Tutorials for Beginners. I am very excited to say we have finally made it to debugging. So what is debugging? Simply put, it's finding and solving the problems in our code, and it's one of the most important skills you're going to learn as a software engineer. So before we get started, please pause the video and copy this code down to where it executes a printed numbered list. The first thing we need to do is make sure we are building and running in debug mode. So if you build in release mode, it will not let you debug because it doesn't build with what are called debug symbols. So make sure you switch to debug. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a breakpoint. Now a breakpoint is exactly what it sounds like. It is a point in the code at which we want to break out of our execution and pause to where we can see what's going on. To add a breakpoint, you can either click the line you want to add it on and press F9, or you can hover over where the breakpoints live on this little gray strip, and you see the circle under my cursor, and then you can click to add and click to remove the breakpoint. So let's start off by adding a breakpoint on the opening curly brace of main. So the minute the main method is entered, we're going to break our execution and stop right here. So let's run this in debug mode and you'll see it stopped. You can see this yellow arrow on our breakpoint and our line is highlighted. If we look at our console window, we haven't done anything yet. So now that we're stopped at a breakpoint, let's take a look and see how Visual Studio has changed. So now you can see our project execution button has changed into continue. We have a stop button. We have a restart button, which it will stop the application and start it back up. Then we have several debug buttons. The ones that we will be going into are step into, step over, and step out. Also, if you look at the bottom, you'll see we have some additional tabs, autos, locals, watch, call stack, breakpoint list. All of these are only accessible to you when you are debugging. Okay, so the first thing let's look at is the continue button. So we have a breakpoint, we've executed to the breakpoint, and we've stopped. Now, if we press the continue button, what it's going to do is resume execution until it hits another breakpoint. So for our purposes, it's going to run the for loop, it's going to wait for the read line, and then once the read line is done, it's going to terminate our execution because there's no other breakpoint and this breakpoint can't be hit again. So let's run continue. And you'll see that it printed our list. And right now we are at console read line. So if we hit a read line, we will terminate. So now let's add a breakpoint here inside of our for loop and run this again. So we are going to stop at the first curly brace. But now when we continue, you see nothing's happened. Now when we continue, it's going to run and stop at the next breakpoint. So again, we haven't done anything except declare our I and do our checks to make sure we can do our for loop execution, which we can. So now we are on the execution print numbered name. So now what's going to happen when we continue is it's going to print the name and then it's going to go to our next execution of our for loop so Adam will get printed and then Bill will be next but we're going to hit the breakpoint again because we are continuing until the next breakpoint so when we continue we look at our execution and you see it printed Adam and now we're here again if we hit continue and then continue and then continue and then we look at our list, you see it printed three more because we're stopping at this breakpoint every iteration of our list. Now say we're debugging and we're happy with what we've seen. You can remove the breakpoint while debugging, just like that, and you'll see where it's stopped at still, but you can see that your breakpoint is gone. Now you can press continue and the execution will finish because there's not another breakpoint to hit. You remove the only one. And now we can hit our read line. Okay, now I know we're writing these names to our console, but let's pretend we're not. Let's say that what we're writing in our code has no output. 
but it still needs to happen and something is wrong with it. So let's move our breakpoint to inside of our loop. Let's say this is where the problem, we think the problem is in here. So let's run and we hit our breakpoint. We don't have our console open, so how do we know what's happening? So let's start by taking a look at these three tabs below. The autos tab automatically populates objects and their values that you might want to see while you're debugging. Now this can give you useful information. This can also give you not useful information. Like we know we have a method print numbered name. This doesn't really tell us anything interesting right now, but we might be interested in I because that's our loop index. And we might also be interested in names, which we know has a count of six because we have six names. And we can also drop names open and see all of the indices and what's in them. So say if we were populating this list with our code or from user input, this may be very useful to see what is currently in our list and where it is. Because we know if we are at I zero and we are about to index names at I, that it should be Adam based on this watch value right here. So the next tab, the locals tab, is only going to give you locally scoped variables. So right now we are in main. We declared names outside of main, so we're not going to see names, even though names is in our class scope. It's not in the current debug scope here. So we won't see names in this scope, but we will see the arguments from the main method, and we will see our i and any other variables we might have declared in this scope here. So that can also be useful if we're trying to narrow down a problem to a specific scope. Now the third tab is a custom watch tab. It starts off with no values, but you can add values to it. So let's say I want to watch i and I want to watch names. So I can add those two and have a nice clean watch window free of all of the other variables that Visual Studio thinks I might want to see. So if you don't want these anymore, you can right click delete or you can press the delete button to remove them and you can customize these watch values any way that you like. Okay, so now that we've created watch values and know how they work, let's make a problem for ourselves to where we have to debug it and use them. So let's say we ran our application for a customer. And the customer's like, wait, why does your numbering start off at zero? Adam should be the first person. So we say, okay, I get it. We, we can fix that. We go in here and we'll say, well, we're printing I, we're, we're passing I, and that's our number. So our numbering is going to be exactly what our index is, which starts at zero. Well, we don't want to change our index, but we do want to pass this basically what is i plus one we want it to be one two three four not zero one two three so maybe we say okay let's just let i equals i plus one so now this is going to start at one and everybody's going to be happy so we run this and we're like wait a minute one three five what why did it skip two and four and uh, wait a minute it should have started with adam but instead it started with bill so when you run into a problem like that, either it's going to be like, oh, I know what's wrong, and you go fix it, or it's like, hmm, that looks right to me. What's going on? And that's when you need to debug. So let's say we don't know what's going on. So we want to debug at print numbered name. We know I must be 135 because that's what we're printing. So let's just see what happens. So let's run this. Now we have our watch value i in our watch already, and it's at one, so that's what we expect. So let's continue, and uh-oh, the next time we hit our breakpoint, i has jumped to three. So now we know something between the first execution of this loop and our next execution of this loop, i has jumped more than it should have, and that's where our step operators are going to come in. So the three step operators that we have are step in, step over and step out. Now step in means we keep going deeper and deeper in the code. Step over is we're going to stay at the same level 
in the code. And step out means we want to go back to the previous level in the code. Now that sounds kind of confusing, but when you see it, it will make sense. So before we debug our actual problem, let's see what these step functions can do. So let's put a breakpoint on i equals i plus 1, and let's run to it and break. So now we have the first function step into, which we keep going deeper and deeper in the code. So here we have i equals i plus 1. There's no deeper level to go into, so it's just going to execute the line. But now we're on print numbered name, which has a deeper scope, which is this method body right here. So if we hit jump into, step into, it's going to step into this method and crawl through its code. And if there was another method call in here, it would keep going into each method call, going deeper and deeper until you hit it, and then it'll pop back out to where you started, and then keep going. So let's restart, go back to our breakpoint, and now let's look at step over. So step over is going to stay at the same level of the code. So here we're just going to execute. Now print numbered name, what it's going to do is it's going to run print numbered name, but it's going to step over the whole method rather than stepping into it. So when we do this, we go here, and then we keep going and going from there. Now the last function is step out. So if we run back to our breakpoint and we get here, now step out will take us out of the current inner scope. So right now we're in a for loop execution. So if we step out, we're actually going to execute this, then we're executing this, we're hitting this, and we're going back into here just like that. So it actually ran a whole loop execution. Now say we step into print numbered name. So now we're in this scope. And if we step out here, we're going to step all the way out of this method and pop back up here. So say you jumped into something and you saw what you needed to see, but you need to keep debugging, you can step out of it to get back to the previous level that you were at. Okay, now that we know how to step through our code, let's solve our problem. So if we run to our breakpoint, our i is zero. Let's go ahead and add a watch for our names and expand that. So now let's step over. So we're at print numbered name. And our i is 1, that's what we would want, because we want our list to start at 1. But now we can see that since our i is 1, we're going to get names i1. So let's jump into that and confirm. So let's go into here. And now let's add a watch for name. And you can see name is Bill, because names at 1 is Bill. So we found our first problem there, that starting our i at 1 means that we're going to get the wrong name out of our thing. So we don't actually need to use our index. But why is it jumping from 1, 3, 5? So let's, let's, let's keep going. So let's step out, back up to here. And now let's step over. Let's step over. Our i is still 1. Okay, wait, we just hit our i++. Plus plus. We step that, and now our i is 2. Oh, I see, because now when we get here, we're going to step over it again, and our i is 3. So what's happening is we're starting at 0. We're incrementing our i to 1. We're printing the wrong name with it. But then our for loop is incrementing our i again. So we're actually going 1, 3, 5 because we're going up one, and then we're going up one again. So now we've solved both of our core problems. So from what we learned debugging, we know we don't need to change the base index because that's how we're getting all of our names. So what we need to do is we need to create a variable that represents the current list number. And we can start that off at zero, and then we can take the current list number and make that equals to i plus 1. So now we have a separate variable that's going to represent i plus 1 without changing our index. So now we can use current list number as our number.
So now when we run that, we can see that our list numbers are correct. And if they weren't, we would come back into here, we'd place another debug point, we would run to it, we would add current list number to our watch, and then we would start stepping to make sure what happened. So now you can see I is one, current list number is two, I is two, current list number is three, and it does exactly what we want all the way until the list is finished. So we've solved our problem. Now I want to show you a shortcut that you can use the majority of the time. So these watch windows are great and they have wonderful purposes. But for most of your debugging, you just need to see something really quick and you're not debugging something so complicated that needs many, many values. So what you can do is you can hover objects as you debug. So we've run to current list number. Current list number is zero. We can look at our eye by hovering it and see that our eye is zero. Now we can step over it and we can hover it again and see that it's one. We can jump into print numbered name. We can hover and see that our number is one and that our name is Adam. If we wanted to, we could hover names and drop this open and we could see all of our names. And at any point, any variable that's in scope or in context, we can just hover it and see what it is as we debug, which makes things really, really quick. So every time we go, we can step out, step out, and we can see everything as it changes without having to look away from our code. We can just hover over it and get it that easily. So that wraps up the very basics of debugging. I know this was a long video, so if you have any questions, please ask. Next up, we're going to start doing some object-oriented programming, which is a really fun step. So thank you for watching, everybody. I do appreciate you. Until next time, as always, take care.